Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, before I start, you know, I, I, I feel like I say this a lot, but I just want to say it again that it, I am extremely grateful to Pastor Jeff and all of you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you because I do recognize that there are other people in my situation who are not as fortunate to be able to use their gifts um, in the way that you guys allow me to. And I don't ever want to get tired of saying it because it's really just a tremendous blessing. And, you know, I, I had to record a video for something this week where I had to tell about myself. And I was just kind of explaining, you know, where I go to church and wh who I serve. And, like, I wasn't planning on crying, <laughs> but I kind of started to and just realized, like, how blessed I am to be here to place that um, um, champions me and what God has called me to. And so I just want to formally again and again and again, thank you for that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't follow the Lord prompt, it prompting, Lord's prompting in my gifting this morning. I do have a few uh, prophetic things that I'm just get some prophetic business that I'm going to get out of the way before I speak. Um, so I have a few prophetic words that I just want to speak really quickly. Uh, the gentleman in front of the exit door, that's you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Samantha. Nice to meet you. I was sitting over there and the Lord drew me to you and he said, you're a worship leader. And I said, I don't know if this man sings, plays, I don't know. And he said, it doesn't matter. He's a worship leader. You have a gift, uh, an anointing in worship particularly in leading the people. You are a leader. Wherever you are, you are a leader. And I just want to recognize that in you because there's power behind your worship. I mean, it was just like I'm sitting there running lyrics, serving. Hey, I ran lyrics this morning. I just want to point that out, okay? Um, anyway, and I just I felt like, I mean, it was just like, and I, and I just want to recognize that in you and thank you. I want to thank you as a worship leader on the platform. I don't know anything about you, but I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your worship. I'm grateful the, for the purity of your heart. And I wanted to recognize that. I felt like the Lord wanted me to speak that out in you. Um, and last but not least, you know, I think I've spoken over them before, but you guys have no idea how lucky we are to have Gio and Angela here. Yes. And part of the body of Christ is recognizing the anointing and the gifting in each other and championing it. Yes. And so I'm going to pray over them and speak over them. And I'm asking for all of you today to partner with what I'm going to pray, what I feel like the Lord has led for me to pray over them. Okay. Will you do that with me? Let's stretch out our hands. Lord God, I just praise you and thank you so much for this couple. Lord, there are so many gifted musicians in the world, but these two, they rise above. They rise above, Lord. Not only are they excellent, but they are also anointed of you and have hearts to be used by you. And Lord, I just agree and partner with you opening doors for the world to see their anointing, for the, for the world to hear their instruments, for the Lord to, for you to just open those doors for them to prophesy outside and for hearts to be drawn to you, Lord. And there are people all over the world that need to hear the message that they carry the message that you have given them, Lord. And I ask for you to swiftly open those doors supernaturally for them to walk through, to be your missionaries musically all over the world. Lord, I pray that you would settle in their hearts that you have called them to more and that this is not something that they're making up this is not something that their pride is telling them. No, you have called them to something large, big scale. And we say yes and amen. Yes. And we agree to support them in prayer in whatever means that we need. Because we see what you have put inside of them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
So today's message is called The Chase. I actually wrote a song called The Chase that I forgot about, ironically, um, until I <laughs> was working on this. So today I'm going to speak to you about something that's actually been grieving my heart for some time. And I've wrestled with this whole experiential Christianity thing. I can't tell you how many times I've gone home from events disappointed. Gone home from church services here, just being honest, disappointed. Feeling like in my bones something was supposed to happen on that day. Um, going in to this church services, believing that something was supposed to happen that day. And then, you know, I kind of hype myself up, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting, and then it's nada, nothing. So maybe I kind of over-directed, <laughs> or over-corrected, there it is. Um, and maybe I think became a spiritual curmudgeon for a little bit. Um, I don't know. But the pendulum probably did swing too far the other direction. And I'm just going to be honest, I became really annoyed at the hype. I became annoyed at people who could not just be satisfied with the community and the worship within the local church. Like, why do we have to just go around chasing movements and, and people just to find something cool spiritually? But in the process of that, I admit that I think on some level, I kind of lost my expectation of God moving and then also lost some hope in my brothers and sisters in Christ, which was not good. Yet here I am now, and I feel like I have a little bit more clarity on this. Recently, I've experienced what you might call, well, what you might call, what I definitely call a revival in my life. And I would actually say that that revival stemmed from a miracle. But you see, I didn't have a limb that grew back. I wasn't cured of an incurable disease. I didn't have some kind of crazy supernatural experience with God on a mountaintop or in a vision, although I would welcome that. That would be great. Um, but I did experience something that radically changed my life. So it may not have been some kind of crazy hype supernatural experience that honestly many are chasing after or trying to figure out some sort of prayer or ministry formula in order to come about, but it was radical for me. And I'm gonna continue to testify if you don't mind because I think this is important. I have been healed three times of what I called some significant physical issues for myself. And one of those times actually was supernatural. And I've shared this with the church before, but there are new people here. Um, I stood on the stage leading worship during a Palm Sunday service um, in a Baptist church. And this was really before a time that I actually even believed in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And I was standing in front leading a very, a song that was very vertical in worship, just glorifying King Jesus. And uh, the fire of God came and sat on my chest and he healed me in that moment of a heart defect. And that was later confirmed a few weeks later. But even in that experience, as grateful as I am for it and as wild and crazy it was, I'm sorry, but if your chest catches on fire, that's pretty, that's something. I had to keep singing, by the way. I had to keep going. It was kind of a long song. There was a whole choir. It was a big church. Chest catches on fire. I knew in that moment the Lord was doing something to me, and I just had to keep going. And I mean, I told Gabriel afterwards, because I was like, I think the Lord just healed me. You know, it was kind of amazing. Um, but even that, that, that event really does not hold a candle to the most recent miracle in my life. So what happened, right? What was the formula? What was the miracle, right? You guys wanna know what happened, right? Well, the miracle in my life was joy. The Lord supernaturally brought back to life and restored some of the things in my life that I thought were dead and long gone. And through all of that, he restored the joy, the joy of knowing and following Jesus, the joy of knowing that my every breath, my every move, the, that my very life is held in the hands of Jesus and that his ways for me are good. 
And this joy actually birds a lot of freedom in other areas of my life, um, freedom and confidence that you only hear about or you see in other people and you're like, man, I want to be like that. And and the formula for all of those things was finally getting to the point where I surrendered every single thing and started chasing Jesus rather than my preferences. Because let's just face it, so many of these ex expectations in, uh, of experiences that, that we are chasing after are really just something that we would prefer to see or prefer to be a part of rather than just maybe what God actually has for us. Now, this sermon is not about joy, but I do want to say this really quickly. If you think that you've experienced joy, like if you think, I think, you've probably not really. Uh, joy, even though I just tried my best to explain it to you, is, is really kind of unex unexplainable. It's really life-changing, and I can tell you it's a miracle. So... Just in case, just to clarify, I know some of you, well, she might be, she's bragging. Like, she, she's got, you know, she's being real confident up here and standing in a posture of pride. And I can tell you that I am bragging, absolutely. And that I am absolutely sitting here in a posture of pride, but not in myself because, quite frankly, I am embarrassed about how long it took me to get to this point. <laughs> but I am boasting in the everlasting kindness and faithfulness of my God, my Savior, my Jesus, and I will boast about what Jesus has done in my life. So I'm starting with this testimony because I want you to understand something. Pastor Jeff has brought to you very timely words, right, about not giving up on God's promises. He even followed up with some practical steps of how to walk this out. And I'm here today to put a bow on it by telling you that your process in pursuing the promises of God, your process in seeing the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit work in your lifetime your process should not include chasing experiences or really even chasing goals or dreams, but instead merely just chasing after Jesus. Yeah. I heard Stephanie Gretzinger uh, say recently in, her, in an interview that Jesus is the dream. I am happy to tell you that when Jesus is your dream, when Jesus is the vision that you have your eyes set on, those goals, those desires in your heart, when they actually finally do come to fruition, what you really experience is more of Jesus through those goals and those dreams coming to fulfillment. Those goals and dreams are actually just secondary. But experience and preference chasing is the MO of today's church. And, you know, this is not just the younger generation, by the way. They had to learn it from somewhere, and you can't tell me that they're just learning it from the world. We chase the newest movement, the newest teacher, the new cool pastor. Um, I think skinny jeans are finally going out. Can we just say amen? Um, yeah. Um, the coolest new worship group. On, and on one hand, I want you to know that I am sympathetic to this. You know, it's the culture of today's Christian church, um, and celebrity culture is all over social media. And I know we talk about this kind of stuff a lot at APC, and I almost deleted half of this message so that I didn't sound like a religious jerk or, or an old fart or something. I don't know. But the, the, the honest truth is that the proof is in the pudding for this, and um, it goes beyond our walls. Like, I'm not even accusing anyone in this room, but let's just be honest if the shoe fits, okay? Um, but if this weren't such a pressing problem, we could just let it go. But our responsibility to you is to address it and shepherd you because then you can go outside of these walls and be a part of helping others chase Jesus. I remember years ago, story time is almost over, I promise. I'm trying now to get my stories over with at the beginning just to kind of keep things going. But I remember years ago, I was sitting with a woman who is a bit older than me, and it was the first time that we had hung out. She invited me to her home uh, for breakfast. And 
she proceeded to talk to me about um, her, she and her husband over the years having going to this conference and that conference, all, like all of the big kind of Pentecostal charismatic conferences and big churches trying to find the Holy Spirit and see miracles and see the signs and wonders and just experience the Holy Spirit in that way. And I remember as I sat and listened to her talk about how great all of that was. And, and then she then turned to me and said, but I don't hear from God. My marriage is falling apart and my daughter doesn't honor and respect me. And then she looked at me and said, can you tell me how to hear from God? Because I just don't know if I hear him. And I remember I could hardly form words in that conversation. I was speechless. And honestly, this was an ongoing problem with her, really as long as I knew her and was in relationship with her. And now I realize what I should have said is that part of the reason she was struggling to hear from God, the reason her marriage was falling apart, the reason her children were, were, were not honoring her and respecting her um, is because they spent years mistaking that their problems would be solved by chasing an experience rather than just simply chasing Jesus. My friends, the solution to your problems in life are not this miraculous sign and wonder that you're all longing for. It's in chasing Jesus. So we're actually going to start today by kind of de defining what miracle signs and wonders are by looking at the Greek and Hebrew text in the Old and New Testament. We, I, you, if you come to all people's church, you know, you, we just, we're all a bunch of teachers. <laughs> really, you know, we, we are all a bunch of nerds, you know, but the truth of the matter is that is that a lot of scripture, just from personal experience, is misunderstood if you don't go here. Um, you're going to interpret things wrong. You're going to understand things wrong. So that's why we like to take you to the original text, because we don't want to interpret things incorrectly. All right, so in the Old Testament, there are two primary Hebrew words to consider. Um, the first word is mofaith, which is a special display of God's power. This whole definition has to do with power. Power um, for God's power, and then power that... Um, God will actually enable someone to have in order to uh, be a vessel of a sign and wonder. Um, this word is actually interchangeably translated as miracle, sign, or wonder. One word that is sometimes translated as miracle, sometimes translated as sign, sometimes translated as wonder. Do you kind of see where I'm starting to go a little bit? All right. The next word is oath. I think I'm saying that correctly. I'm going to start doing all of my um, Hebrew and IPA. Where am I, PA? Only like, yeah, two people. But yeah, all the singers in the room. Okay. All right. Sometimes this word is actually translated as token, but I think one of the, the most interesting parts of this definition is that it is a distinguishing mark. Um, and it has a lot, of, a lot behind that, but I just kind of want to focus on the distinguishing mark um, Part of that definition. Okay, next words. We're going to now go to the New Testament. We're going to do New Testament lingo. By the way, I chose this really fun font because I wanted to kind of show that, you know, miracle signs and wonders, you know, and all the flashiness with it. Like, I don't even like that font, to be honest. Like, it's a bit much. So I was trying to be funny with it, but I really, now on, on reflection, after I sent Sam my slides, I was like, yeah, it's not really coming across the way I wanted it to, but I decided to leave it. Okay, in the New Testament, we, we've, this word has been said from this platform so many times, dunamis. I think that word is funny to say, dunamis, right? That's funny. That's not funny. Okay. Anyway, this, again, this word, again, is related to power, strength, or ability. Um, sometimes it's an inerrant power, a power, power that's residing in a thing um, that's God-given, or even just God himself. God himself is all-powerful, right? Um, the power for performing miracles, um, this is interesting. Um, this word is also, can also mean moral power, 
and excellence of soul. I really liked that definition. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's also a tie here to military, power and numbers, uh, power and strength, that kind of thing. All right, but in the New Testament, the more common word that's translated miracle, sign, and wonder is semion. And um, most often, this is the word that you're going to see that's used for miracle or sign. And this literally just means, again, a sign, a distinguishing mark, a distinguishing mark. All right, so what are we getting from this? We're getting that miracle signs and wonders are indication of an encounter with God. Both the recipient and the vessel are marked by that encounter. The mere definition of these words alludes to the reality that there is a marking or an encounter or an action that's not, that not just sets the person or the situation apart, but it says, sets those impacted or being used as vessels apart by being marked or being touched by God through the miraculous. So there is an experience that occurs because of the coming into contact with the presence of God or being touched by God. In other words, the experiences are the results of encounters. So if you want to experience a miracle, there must first be an encounter with God. A person can choose to accept or reject or ignore that encounter, but that doesn't make it any less of, an ex uh, of a reality. Let me give you an example. Right now, right here in this moment, I, we're in the same room and I am speaking. You can choose to ignore me. You can choose to tune me out or reject everything that I am saying, but that doesn't negate the reality that right here in this moment, I am speaking to you and I am in contact with you. I am in your presence. I am speaking to you. You are encountering my being. So the things that we tend to categorize as miracles, signs, and wonders are all but just a small scope of the supernatural, miraculous nature of God that is constantly surrounding us and available to us to encounter. In other words, in our attempt to not put God in a box by claiming that he does all of these extraordinary things like growing back limbs and healing cancer and all of these things, what we have actually done is just put him in a different box, one that's instead missing the everyday miraculous that we take for granted that we don't recognize, that we dismiss or neglect to give credit to because it doesn't come in this package, in this specific looking experiential box that has been sculpted by modern day Christianity. And in that, in, in that box, by the way, we've concocted through what? Our own preferences. Wow. So I obviously don't need to lecture this group that miracle signs and wonders are for today. That's a whole other sermon. I sort of covered that back in November. Um, but the truth is that in the entirety of scripture, miracle signs and wonders are going to occur for the following reasons, okay? And we're going to kind of walk through this as we close out. You're going to see that they magnify God, that they preach Christ, they reveal the power of God, they testify to the character of God, and... They execute judgment. Sometimes many of these purposes are kind of folded all into one miracle, um, and other times it's more about one, more than one thing or another. And there are about hundreds of miracles documented in Scripture. I did try to compile a list uh, from, from other lists that I found, and none of them look the same, which is interesting because we're now seeing that a lot of different people define miracles in different ways. But today what I want to do is show some biblical examples um, where each of these purposes are kind of obvious to us and kind of pop off, the, pop off the page to us. So let's first talk about a miracles that magnify. All right, Old Testament, 1 Kings 18. Um, the, there, it's kind of like the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, okay? And so what ends up happening is they prepare a sacrifice for their gods, and Elijah prepares a sacrifice, and they get all crazy, right? Hooping and hollering hype. Ooh, yikes. They get a little hype, okay? And what they're trying to get their gods to do, and then you have Elijah who offers up a simple, humble prayer, and God comes down and consumes his sacrifice. 
And magnifying means that it, there is a recognition of worth. And when you recognize that, it elicits a response from you. So when God came and consumed the fire, what happened? The people recognized. They fell on their face and said, the Lord, he is God. That was a miraculous sign that occurred and the people responded. All right, another example is Matthew 17. The transfiguration is actually a sign of the miraculous because what happens? Jesus has a physical change in experience in front of Peter, James, and John, all right? Moses and Elijah appear, and then there's the cloud, and then God speaking, and what is the response of Peter, James, and John? They fell on their face and worshiped because they were able to recognize who Jesus was in that moment. All right. Speaking of, preach Christ is the next one. Thank you, Brother Daryl. He's one step ahead of me. Okay, so when you're pre, the, the definition of preach, okay, I, I looked this up one day because I was like, man, we call them people preachers and pastors and all the fivefold mess, like it gets kind of mushy. And so I looked this up one day and to preach, what does it mean? It means to make an official announcement. That's what it actually means if you look it up, okay, in the Greek, to make an official announcement. So we're going to talk about first, um, I mixed these up on this slide. Did, we're, the, I got the Old Testament and New Testament just so you guys are following me. That's a mistake on my part. Okay, so Old Testament first, pop down to where it says New Testament. Joshua 5.13, Pastor Jeff has spoken about this encounter on Sunday nights between Joshua and the commander, right? So in, in Joshua 5.13, the commander appears to Joshua. He identifies himself as the commander of the Lord's army, okay? The reason I say that this preaches is because this is an announcement in that moment. Jesus is identifying himself, okay? And, and he's identifying himself and his role. And what does Joshua do? He understands and he responds by what? Yes, by bowing down. And this is revelation. So Joshua's only, Joshua's only response to that declaration um, was to worship. All right. <laughs> Three. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is actually the chunk of scripture that I'm going to close with today. But in Acts 3, Peter um, heals the lame man and then preaches to the choir. Okay, so there's a, there's, a, there's a miracle that occurs that we'll talk about more in a minute, and then he preaches to the choir. Okay, going on. Next is revealing the power, God's power. In the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 12, God has to respond to the people because basically they set themselves up for failure and asking for a king when they really should have just been satisfied with God, okay? And there's a whole bit, I mean, and this, this is a big disaster for them. They come to Samuel and they say, give me a king, Samuel's upset, and the Lord's like, no, give the people what they ask for. Go ahead, go ahead. And, you know, it, it starts out and it looks like things are going okay and then it quickly turns south. And in Samuel 12, Samuel addresses them, and God, that God responds to Samuel's address with rain and thunder, miraculous. It's a miraculous event, and the people, the scripture says the people immediately realize they messed up. <laughs> Whoops! But God used that miraculous to reveal his power to them in that moment. Like, nobody can take the place, no king can replace the power of God. There's no power that any king can have that would replace his power. Okay, um, and then the last one is, we all know this story. We love this story. Matthew 4, Jesus calms the storm. Everybody freaking out in the boat, and Jesus is like, I got this. And he didn't have to do any kind of hollering or anything. He just calmed the storm. That was a revelation of his power. Next, um, miracles testify of God or Jesus and their character. In the Old Testament, Gosh, go read it, guys. Every single one of the wilderness miracles, um, which are often birthed from their complaining, um, are a testimony of God's character. Because even in their complaining, God still miraculously provided for them. All right? And then, obviously, Matthew 15, the feeding of 5,000. That's kind of a miracle. But sometimes I wonder when I think about this miracle, I wonder how many people actually knew that was a miracle because there's 5,000 people there. The disciples knew because they saw how much was there. 
But the other people were just there, you know, kind of participants. Sometimes I wonder about that. That's just a side note. All right. Last but not least, judgment miracles. Sometimes God does, a, does the miraculous as a means of judgment because he's not playing around and it's necessary to get the attention of his people. This is sort of connected to Pastor Jeff's sermon from last week. So this has actually been said to me before by people in this room. So when you hear someone say, stop messing around or you're going to get yourself killed, they aren't talking about necessarily talking about anything physically dangerous. This is what they're talking about. When it comes to the worship of God and heart motives, God is not messing around. So in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 26, I'm not going to spend a ton of time because this is my text for next week. But um, Uzziah is inflicted with leprosy um, because he um, gets too big for his britches and starts touching things that he's not supposed to touch. And, um, and the Lord was just not having it. And so that was a response to his rebellion. Number 16, we just talked about it at the beginning, Korah and the clan are swallowed up by the ground. And I want you to know that both of these people, Uzziah and Korah, are Israelites. They are God's chosen people. New Testament, Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira, Sapphira, I've heard it five different ways, three Sapphira, thank you. That's what I thought. Somebody tried to correct me earlier this week, and I went, I'm pretty sure. Anyway. All right. I have believers question mark, okay? Um, and then I have Acts 13, the sorcerer inflicted with blindness, and then I have non-believer because we know that one. All right? So I n did not realize that there was this debate on if Ananias and Sapphira were believers. Um, and so I kind of opened up a dialogue. I'm going to share what you said, if you don't mind, about this. Because we're kind of like, it's not really, maybe not exactly clear in Scripture. And, you know, Jeff mentioned, well, there's nothing to say that they're not believers because they're included in part of that group. And he said, it seems unlikely that God would hold non-believers to that high of, uh, of uh, uh, accountability. What was the word you used? I don't know if I said that correctly. Um, and so this has huge implications, okay? Because what did they do? They lied. They lied, all right? And then Acts 13, the sorcerer inflicted with blindness, same kind, of, same kind of idea here. And most of us are not praying for judgment miracles, right? Anybody in this room praying for a judgment miracle right now? Okay. Um, yet they're a reality and they do serve a purpose and they are no less part of God's purposes than the others, even if they make us uncomfortable to speak about. Because ultimately God's sovereignty, in, in, in God's sovereignty, he chooses when a miracle is supposed to occur and who he gets to choose who the vessels are and who the recipients are. Okay. So there was not one miracle in scripture that was chased, by the way. And while we're here, praying and chasing are two different things. You can be chasing in your praying, but just because you're praying doesn't mean that you're chasing the right thing. Your heart and the fruit of your life reveals the truth in this situation. Each and every miracle in scripture came from God's sovereign hand and God's sovereign timing. And honestly, through the intercession of pure hearts, pure hearts of the vessel, pure hearts of other people who desired for God to be magnified through that miracle. Um, Zipporah prayed for her husband. Zipporah and uh, her act of intercession over Moses, because Moses was about to, uh, God was about to take Moses out. Okay? So why would God suddenly operate differently today in how he executes miracles? He doesn't. My favorite personal example in scripture um, is basically the first miracle um, recorded where Peter, Peter is the, the one who's administering it or he is the vessel of the miracle. Uh, but before we read this scripture together, I want you to know that you always have a choice on whether or not you're going to be used of God. So God instructed Peter, Peter to move in this moment. And so he at this point was responsible for acting and then God performed through his yes. All right, 1 Peter 3, let's read this together. This is, a, I just think this is, this is my favorite. I love it so much. I get emotional when I read it. Okay, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man came from birth, 
uh, was a, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, at the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. And this is my favorite part. And Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them, them eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any gold, silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus, Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up. He stood up on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All of the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen um, so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They, were, they all rushed in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Then Peter preaches, all right? So then he, what does he say? People of Israel... Why is this, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us through, as though we had, uh, gosh, so sorry. And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk on our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all of our ancestors who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus who you handed over and rejected before Pilate, dis despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murder. You killed the author of life. Ouch. But God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all of the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. This miraculous healing came from the hearing and declaration of the name Jesus Christ. Sometimes I wonder if church culture as a whole cares more about the person's healing than it cares about the fact that that person met Jesus. And remember, sometimes someone's healing isn't even about just that person, right? Sometimes it's about the people who saw. What about all those people who just saw this man healed? Did not his healing testify to others about Jesus? Did it not draw the people to Jesus? Did it not set up Peter to actually preach Christ? It set Peter up to do more preaching, more testifying. So the miracle and the sign and the wonder only becomes an experience after the encounter and after the seeking. This beggar encountered Jesus through Peter, and then he experienced a miracle, which then led him to what circle back around to Jesus. If you chase the experience, you might actually miss the encounter, my friends. What bothers me is seeing miracle signs and wonders done at all these big conferences that are celebrated without not, men not much mention of Jesus, not much mention of who this is that actually healed them. God is kind and merciful in those instances. I mean, but how terrible is it when he performs a miracle and we look right past him as if he didn't have anything to do with it? In fact, the miracles are supposed to be less about what he does for us and more about who he is. Miracle signs and wonders should be eliciting awe and wonder from us. There are some people who actually came to Jesus and got healed or who come to Jesus like at these conferences, these things, these events. Um, they're going to come and they're going to get healed and they actually never come to know Jesus. Do you know that that happens? They don't decide to follow him. And I don't have answers for all of that other than we have a choice, right? Like I said earlier, we have a choice whether or not to accept that encounter and let it change us. And, you know, I'm kind of content in, in not understanding all of this because, honestly, it doesn't matter at the end of the day because God will still be glorified through that miracle. There are some people who are healed 
and then their issues come back. But there are some people whose body may be physically healed, but their souls remain untouched. I'm talking about Christians, okay? There are Christians who believe in Jesus who have been physically healed that are still living in other forms of bondage. This is why we, we and you know, God's so merciful. God is so kind and merciful. But this is why we can't just pray and pursue for a physical healing. We've got to pursue for wholeness, wholeness, complete wholeness for all of the people. God will always be glorified. God cares about the souls of the men that he, man that he created. If the miracle does not pierce the heart of that person to be forever changed in one way or another, having encountered the presence of God, there is a missed opportunity. And if we as a body neglect to disciple that situation, that will be on us. So we care about the healings, we care about the miracles that God does in our lives because they are all displays of his power. But the bigger miracle, the miracle that we should all be praying for is that those who are the recipients of God's miraculous power would choose Jesus, that the Jesus that they encountered through that miracle. Because the miraculous spirit experience will not do anyone any good if there is a choice to continue in unrepentant sin or rebellion or a choice to hold on to your bondage, Christians. That healing or miracle doesn't wash away your sins or your problems. Only Jesus can do that. Uh, and that experience that you're chasing, if Jesus is not in it, it's not going to save your soul and it's not going to change your life. I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come up um, and prepare as I kind of close. I want you guys to be sure that the ministries and the movements that you're following and that you're attracted to the pastors, the leaders, the podcasters, the mentors, the worship leaders, the worship music that you listen to, make sure that those people that you're following, um, you're, you're following them because of the Jesus that you see in them and not because of the experience that you're receiving from them. And I share this with you so that if anyone, even just one person in this room is chasing something other than Jesus, that that can change for you today. I shared this message with you so that all people's church is united and a front to chase Jesus. I share this with you so that when any person in this room ministers and prays for someone in faith for healing, that we are actually chasing for the manifestation of Jesus through that act and not the act itself. I share this with you to hopefully open your eyes to the reality that there are miracle signs and wonders that are happening all around you, and they aren't always a big show. Remember how the Lord multiplied the flour and the olive oil for the widow? Yeah. Nobody saw that. It wasn't in front of a crowd, but that miracle changed their life, saved their lives, and it happened in the privacy of their own home. I share all of this with you so that you will rejoice just as much when a brother or sister gets free of a pornography addiction than when you see some kind of miraculous, crazy hype thing happen in front of you like a limb growing back. They're both a miracle. I share all of this with you so that the fear of God remains intact in you so that Jesus is the recipient of all of the attention, of all of the honor through any good that you may be in ministry. I say this so that none of us may be blown to and fro with the winds of experience, right? And lose Jesus in the process. The revival everyone says they are seeking isn't found, it is, isn't found in chasing an experience. It's found in chasing Jesus. And until we fully understand what that looks like, and until we finally surrender to whatever that looks like, we're not gonna see revival, much less miracles, signs, and wonders. And we know that our hearts are to see both of those things. So we're gonna actually have the opportunity to worship again tonight, uh, today, today. It's still morning, is it afternoon yet? Yeah, okay, 12, 18, great. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is because we need to respond, right? We need to respond. We need to chase Jesus. And I love the song that we're going to use simply because it's a very vertical song. And it's about recognizing 
who Jesus is and our position. The, uh, the bridge, the veil is torn, the doors swing, wi swing wide. I see glory as I run inside the throne room before you. I jump up and down and get crazy and dance. No, I bow. I bow. I bow. There was a time where I just... I wanted all that, and I do want that. By the way, you guys should be dancing more. Can I just say it? You should be. You should be dancing more. It is a form of worship. And there is a time, a brief time, a brief window, where I drank the Kool-Aid and thought that was where the experience was. And then I got humbled. Then I got humbled. Yes, that is a posture of praise. That is. But the pursuit of Jesus looks like bowing. Looks like bowing. So if you need a miracle today in your life, look, I, you know, I'm not, I, I may be prophetic, but I'm not a genie in a bottle. God is not either. But like Peter, what I can tell you is what I can give you, right? What I, and what I can give you is Jesus. What I can share with you about is Jesus, and Jesus wants to encounter you this morning. Jesus wants you to look at him in the face. Jesus wants you to sit in his presence. Jesus wants you to receive grace from him today. Jesus wants you to surrender today. Your surrender is your greatest act of worship. Jesus wants you to give him your everything because he has already given everything to you. And what you will experience from this encounter could very well change your life today. So let's stand and worship together. Thank you, sir.
the doors fling wide, I see glory as I run inside your throne room before you. I bow. The veil is torn, the doors fling wide. I see glory as I run inside your throne before you. I bow. The veil is torn, the doors fling wide. I see glory. signs and wonders in this place. But really, we're just asking for more of an encounter of you. We want to encounter you more. Lord, I humbly ask that you would do whatever it takes. I have prayed this to you before. And when we pray these prayers, by the way, we don't know what we're asking for sometimes. But I have prayed and I pray this for our people. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to get us on the right track. Do whatever it takes, Lord. Humble us, posture us to encounter you. Lord, help us to celebrate your presence in this place. So Lord, I pray that if there are people here today that are thirsty for that encounter with Jesus, that are ready for that encounter of Jesus, for that touch of Jesus, that they need to change their life, that you would give them the confidence to come and to be prayed for, to come and be partnered with, Lord, for what you have for them. What an honor it is to walk as a people of God, to walk with each other. We don't have to be alone. Thank you. If you have needs this morning, there are people who will be up front who can pray for you and can pray for you to have that encounter with Jesus, that encounter that will change your life. I know it was not an easy word to hear today, but I know that the Father's heart for us is to just be completely engrossed 
in his presence. And that in that presence, every single need that you have will be met. So thank you. Be blessed. Enjoy your night off or come to TRBC to night of worship. It's always, it's always a really good time. It, and the Lord. I've, I've met the Lord at TRBC many times on this night in the last 10 years. I'm just letting you know. The Spirit shows up. I'm just letting you know. Um, thank you, you guys. Be blessed.